The Mongol Empire Mongolian, Mongolian Esent Guran Listen, Mongolian Cyrillic, Mongolian Aent Grain Mongolian pronunciation, M. I T S N T A also order the horde in Russian chronicles existed during the 13th and 14th centuries it became the largest contiguous land empire in history originating in Mongolia the Mongol empire eventually stretched from eastern Europe and parts of central Europe to the sea of Japan extending northwards into Siberia eastwards and southwards into the Indian subcontinent Indochina and the Iranian plateau and westwards as far as the Levant and the Carpathian mountains the Mongol Empire emerged from the unification of several nomadic tribes in the Mongol homeland under the leadership of Genghis Khan c. 1162-1227, whom a council proclaimed ruler of all the Mongols in 1206. The empire grew rapidly under his rule and that of his descendants, who sent out invading armies in every direction. The vast transcontinental empire connected the east with the west in an enforced Pax Mongolica, allowing the dissemination and exchange of trade, technologies, commodities and ideologies across Eurasia. The empire began to split due to wars over succession, as the grandchildren of Genghis Khan disputed whether the royal line should follow from his son and initial heir Agedei or from one of his other sons, such as Tolui, Chagatai, or Jochi. The Toluids prevailed after a bloody purge of Ogadiad and Chagatade factions, but disputes continued among the descendants of Tolui. A key reason for the split was the dispute over whether the Mongol Empire would become a sedentary, cosmopolitan empire, or would stay true to the Mongol nomadic and steppe-based lifestyle. After Monkey Khan died 1259, rival Kurultai councils simultaneously elected different successors, the brothers Ariq Boke and Kublai Khan, who fought each other in the Toluid Civil War 1260 and also dealt with challenges from the descendants of other sons of Genghis. Kublai successfully took power, but civil war ensued as he sought unsuccessfully to regain control of the Chagatayad and Ogadiad families. During the reigns of Genghis and Agedei, the Mongols suffered the occasional defeat when a less skilled general received a command. The Siberian Tumeds defeated the Mongol forces under Borakula around 1215–1217, Jalal al-Din defeated Shigi Katugu at the Battle of Parwin in 1221, and the Jin generals Haider and Pu'er defeated Dolkolchu in 1230. In each case, the Mongols returned shortly after with a much larger army led by one of their best generals, and were invariably victorious. The Battle of Anjalit in Galilee in 1260 marked the first time that the Mongols would not return to immediately avenge a defeat, due to a combination of the death of Monkey Khan in 1259, the Toluid civil war between Arik Boke and Kabilai, and Burt Khan of the Golden Horde attacking Hulegu in Persia. Although the Mongols launched many more invasions of the Levant, briefly occupying it and raiding as far as Gaza after a decisive victory at the Battle of Wadi al khaznadar in 1299, they withdrew due to various geopolitical factors. By the time of Kublai's death in 1294 the Mongol Empire had fractured into four separate Khanates or empires, each pursuing its own separate interests and objectives, the Golden Horde Khanate in the northwest, the Chagatai Khanate in Central Asia, the Il Khanate in the southwest, and the Yuan Dynasty in the east, based in modern-day Beijing. In 1304 the three western Khanates briefly accepted the nominal suzerainty of the Yuan Dynasty. But in 1368 the Han Chinese Ming dynasty took over the Mongol capital. The Genghisid rulers of the Yuan retreated to the Mongolian homeland and continued to rule there as the northern Yuan dynasty. The Ilkhanate disintegrated in the period 1335-1353. The Golden Horde had broken into competing Khanates by the end of the 15th century whilst the Chagatai Khanate lasted in one form or another until 1687. Topic Name What is referred to in English as the Mongol Empire was called the IKH Mongol ULs IKH Great ULS State Great Mongolian State. In the 1240s, one of Genghis's descendants, Guyuk Khan, wrote a letter to Pope Innocent IV which used the preamble, Dalai Great Oceanic Kagan of the Great Mongolian State ULUS. After the succession war between Kublai Khan and his brother Ariq Boke, Ariq limited Kublai's power to the eastern part of the empire. 
Kublai officially issued an imperial edict on 18 December 1271 to name the country Great Yuan, Dai Yuan or Dai on Ulus to establish the Yuan dynasty. Some sources state that the full Mongolian name was Dai on Yehe Mongol Ulus. Topic: History. Topic: Pre-Empire context. The area around Mongolia, Manchuria, and parts of North China had been controlled by the Liao dynasty since the 10th century. In 1125, the Jin dynasty founded by the Jurchens overthrew the Liao dynasty and attempted to gain control over former Liao territory in Mongolia. In the 1130s the Jin dynasty rulers, known as the Golden Kings, successfully resisted the Karmic Mongol Confederation, ruled at the time by Kabul Khan, great-grandfather of Genghis Khan. The Mongolian plateau was occupied mainly by five powerful tribal confederations, Kanlig, Karites, Karmic Mongol, Naiman, Mergid, and Tata. The Jin emperors, following a policy of divide and rule, encouraged disputes among the tribes, especially between the Tatars and the Mongols, in order to keep the nomadic tribes distracted by their own battles and thereby away from the Jin. Kabul's successor was Ambag Hai Khan, who was betrayed by the Tatars, handed over to the Jurchen, and executed. The Mongols retaliated by raiding the frontier, resulting in a failed Jurchen counterattack in 1143. In 1147, the Jin somewhat changed their policy, signing a peace treaty with the Mongols and withdrawing from a score of forts. The Mongols then resumed attacks on the Tatars to avenge the death of their late Khan, opening a long period of active hostilities. The Jin and Tatar armies defeated the Mongols in 1161. During the rise of the Mongol Empire in the 13th century, the usually cold, parched steppes of Central Asia enjoyed their mildest, wettest conditions in more than a millennium. It is thought that this resulted in a rapid increase in the number of war horses and other livestock, which significantly enhanced Mongol military strength. Topic. Rise of Genghis Khan Known during his childhood as Temujin, Genghis Khan was a son of a Mongol chieftain. As a young man he rose very rapidly by working with Tokhrul Khan of the Karite. The most powerful Mongol leader at the time was Kurtate, he was given the Chinese title, Wang, which means king. Temujin went to war with Wang Khan. After Temujin defeated Wang Khan he gave himself the name Genghis Khan. He then enlarged his Mongol state under himself and his kin. The term Mongol came to be used to refer to all Mongolic-speaking tribes under the control of Genghis Khan. His most powerful allies were his father's friend, Kyriot chieftain Wang Khan Tohoral, and Temujin's childhood and a blood brother, Jamukha of the Jadran clan. With their help, Temujin defeated the Merkit tribe, rescued his wife Bort, and went on to defeat the Naimans and the Tatars. Temujin forbade looting of his enemies without permission, and he implemented a policy of sharing spoils with his warriors and their families instead of giving it all to the aristocrats. These policies brought him into conflict with his uncles, who were also legitimate heirs to the throne. They regarded Temujin not as a leader but as an insolent usurper. This dissatisfaction spread to his generals and other associates, and some Mongols who had previously been allies broke their allegiance. War ensued, and Temujin and the forces still loyal to him prevailed, defeating the remaining rival tribes between 1203 and 1205 and bringing them under his sway. In 1206, Temujin was crowned as the Khagan of the Yeka Mongol Ulu's Great Mongol State, at a Karultai General Assembly, Council. It was there that he assumed the title of Genghis Khan, universal leader, instead of one of the old tribal titles such as Gur Khan or Tiang Khan, marking the start of the Mongol Empire. Topic: Early organization. Genghis Khan introduced many innovative ways of organizing his army, for example dividing it into decimal subsections of Arbans 10 soldiers, Zuans 100, Mingans 1000, and Tumans 10,000. The Keshig, the Imperial Guard, was founded and divided into day and night guards. 
Genghis rewarded those who had been loyal to him and placed them in high positions, as heads of army units and households, even though many of them came from very low-ranking clans, compared to the units he gave to his loyal companions, those assigned to his own family members were relatively few. He proclaimed a new code of law of the empire, Ikh Zasig or Yasa, later he expanded it to cover much of the everyday life and political affairs of the nomads. He forbade the selling of women, theft, fighting among the Mongols, and the hunting of animals during the breeding season. He appointed his adopted brother Shigi Kuthuk as supreme judge Jafarchi, ordering him to keep records of the empire. In addition to laws regarding family, food, and the army, Genghis also decreed religious freedom and supported domestic and international trade. He exempted the poor and the clergy from taxation. He also encouraged literacy, adopting the Uyghur script, which would form the Uyghur Mongolian script of the empire, and he ordered the Uyghur Tatatunga, who had previously served the Khan of Naimans, to instruct his sons. Topic. Push into Central Asia Genghis quickly came into conflict with the Jin dynasty of the Jurchens and the Western Chia of the Tangits in northern China. He also had to deal with two other powers, Tibet and Kara Kitai. Towards the west he moved into Central Asia, devastating Transoxiana and Eastern Persia, then raiding into Kievan Rus a predecessor state of Russia, Belarus, and Ukraine and the Caucasus. Before his death, Genghis Khan divided his empire among his sons and immediate family, making the Mongol Empire the joint property of the entire imperial family who, along with the Mongol aristocracy, constituted the ruling class. Topic. Religious policies Prior to the three Western Khanates' adoption of Islam, Genghis Khan and a number of his Yuan successes placed restrictions on religious practices they saw as alien. Muslims, including Hui, and Jews, were collectively referred to as Hui Hui. Muslims were forbidden from halal or zabia butchering, while Jews were similarly forbidden from kashrut or shehita butchering. Referring to the conquered subjects as our slaves, Genghis Khan demanded they no longer be able to refuse food or drink, and imposed restrictions on slaughter. Muslims had to slaughter sheep in secret. Among all the subject alien peoples, only the Hui Hui say, We do not eat Mongol food. Singhis Khan replied, By the aid of heaven, we have pacified you, you are our slaves. Yet you do not eat our food or drink. How can this be right? He thereupon made him eat. If you slaughter sheep, you will be considered guilty of a crime. He issued a regulation to that effect. In 1279-1280 under Kubilai, all the Muslims say, if someone else slaughters the animal, we do not eat. Because the poor people are upset by this, from now on, Musulman Muslim Hui Hui and Juhu Jewish Hui Hui, no matter who kills the animal will eat it and must cease slaughtering sheep themselves, and cease the right of circumcision. Genghis Khan arranged for the Chinese Taoist master Chu Chu Ji to visit him in Afghanistan, and also gave his subjects the right to religious freedom, despite his own shamanistic beliefs. Topic: Death of Genghis Khan and expansion under Agedei 1227 to 1241. Genghis Khan died on the 18th of August 1227, by which time the Mongol Empire ruled from the Pacific Ocean to the Caspian Sea, an empire twice the size of the Roman Empire or the Muslim Caliphate at their height. Genghis named his third son, the charismatic Agedei, as his heir. According to Mongol tradition, Genghis Khan was buried in a secret location. The regency was originally held by Ogadez's younger brother Tolui until Ogadez's formal election at the Kurultai in 1229. Among his first actions, Agedei sent troops to subjugate the Bashkas, Bulgars, and other nations in the Kipchak controlled steppes. In the east, Ogadez's armies re established Mongol authority in Manchuria, crushing the Eastern Chia regime and the Water Tatars. In 1230, the Great Khan personally led his army in the campaign against the Jin dynasty of China. Ogadez general Subutai captured the capital of Emperor Wanyan Shu in the siege of Kaifeng in 1232. 
The Jin dynasty collapsed in 1234 when the Mongols captured Kaizhou, the town to which Wanyan Shu had fled. In 1234, three armies commanded by Ogadez's sons Kochu and Khotun and the Tangut general Chagan invaded southern China. With the assistance of the Song dynasty the Mongols finished off the Jin in 1234, many Han Chinese and Khatan defected to the Mongols to fight against the Jin. Two Han Chinese leaders, Shi Tianze, Lu Haima, Lu He Ma Luni, and the Khatan Xiao Zhala defected and commanded the three Tumans in the Mongol army. Lu Haima and Shi Tianze served Ogade Khan. Lu Haima and Shi Tiangxiang led armies against Western Chia for the Mongols. There were four Han Tumans and three Khatan Tumans, with each Tumen consisting of 10,000 troops. The Yuan dynasty created a Han army Hanjun from Jin defectors, and another of ex Song troops called the newly submitted army Sin Fujun. In the West Ogadez, General Chormakan destroyed Jalal ad Din Mingbernu, the last Shah of the Khwarizmian Empire. The small kingdoms in southern Persia voluntarily accepted Mongol supremacy. In East Asia, there were a number of Mongolian campaigns into Goryeo Korea, but Ogadez's attempt to annex the Korean peninsula met with little success. Gojong, the king of Goryeo, surrendered but later revolted and massacred Mongol Darfachus overseers. He then moved his imperial court from Gaseong to Gangwa Island. As the empire grew, Agedei established a Mongol capital at Karakoram in northwestern Mongolia. Topic: <inaudible> Invasions of Kievan Rus and Central China. Meanwhile, in an offensive action against the Song dynasty, Mongol armies captured Xiangyang, the Yangtze and Sichuan, but did not secure their control over the conquered areas. The Song generals were able to recapture Xiangyang from the Mongols in 1239. After the sudden death of Ogadez's son Kochu in Chinese territory the Mongols withdrew from southern China, although Koku's brother Prince Khotun invaded Tibet immediately after their withdrawal, Batu Khan, another grandson of Genghis Khan, overran the territories of the Bulgars, the Alans, the Kaipchaks, Bashkas, Morvan, Chuvash, and other nations of the southern Russian steppe. By 1237 the Mongols were encroaching upon Ryazan, the first Kievan Rus principality they were to attack. After a three-day siege involving fierce fighting, the Mongols captured the city and massacred its inhabitants. They then proceeded to destroy the army of the Grand Principality of Vladimir at the Battle of the Sit River. The Mongols captured the Alania capital Magas in 1238. By 1240, all Kievan Rus had fallen to the Asian invaders except for a few northern cities. Mongol troops under Chormakan in Persia connecting his invasion of Transcaucasia with the invasion of Batu and Subutai, forced the Georgian and Armenian nobles to surrender as well. Giovanni de Plano Carpini, the Pope's envoy to the Mongol Great Khan, traveled through Kiev in February 1246 and wrote, They, the Mongols, attacked Russia, where they made great havoc, destroying cities and fortresses and slaughtering men, and they laid siege to Kiev, the capital of Russia, after they had besieged the city for a long time, they took it and put the inhabitants to death. When we were journeying through that land we came across countless skulls and bones of dead men lying about on the ground. Kiev had been a very large and thickly populated town, but now it has been reduced almost to nothing, for there are at the present time scarce 200 houses there and the inhabitants are kept in complete slavery. Despite the military successes, strife continued within the Mongol ranks. Batu's relations with Guyuk, Ogadez's eldest son, and Buri, the beloved grandson of Chagatai Khan, remained tense and worsened during Batu's victory banquet in southern Kievan Rus. Nevertheless, Guyuk and Buri could not do anything to harm Batu's position as long as his uncle Agedei was still alive. Agedei continued with offensives into the Indian subcontinent, temporarily investing UCHCH, Lahore, and Multan of the Delhi Sultanate and stationing a Mongol overseer in Kashmir, though the invasions into India eventually failed and were forced to retreat. In northeastern Asia, Agedei agreed to end the conflict with Goryeo by making it a client state and sent Mongolian princesses to wed Goryeo princes. He then reinforced his Keshig with the Koreans through both diplomacy and military force. Topic. Push into Central Europe The advance into Europe continued with Mongol invasions of Poland and Hungary. 
when the western flank of the Mongols plundered Polish cities, a European alliance among the Poles, the Moravians, and the Christian military orders of the Hospitallers, Teutonic Knights and the Templars assembled sufficient forces to halt, although briefly, the Mongol advance at Legnica. The Hungarian army, the Croatian allies and the Templar Knights were beaten by the Mongols at the banks of the Sajo River on of April 1241. Before Batu's forces could continue on to Vienna and northern Albania, news of Ogadez's death in December 1241 brought a halt to the invasion. As was customary in Mongol military tradition, all princes of Genghis's line had to attend the Karultai to elect a successor. Batu and his western Mongol army withdrew from Central Europe the next year. Topic. Post Agedei power struggles 1241 -1251. Following the great Khan Ogadez's death in 1241, and before the next Karultai, Ogadez's widow Teregin took over the empire. She persecuted her husband's Khatan and Muslim officials and gave high positions to her own allies. She built palaces, cathedrals, and social structures on an imperial scale, supporting religion and education. She was able to win over most Mongol aristocrats to support Ogadez's son Guyuk. But Batu, ruler of the Golden Horde, refused to come to the Karaltai, claiming that he was ill and that the Mongolian climate was too harsh for him. The resulting stalemate lasted more than four years and further destabilized the unity of the empire. When Genghis Khan's youngest brother Temuj threatened to seize the throne, Guyuk came to Karakoram to try to secure his position. Batu eventually agreed to send his brothers and generals to the Karaltai convened by Terejin in 1246. Guyuk by this time was ill and alcoholic, but his campaigns in Manchuria and Europe gave him the kind of stature necessary for a great Khan. He was duly elected at a ceremony attended by Mongols and foreign dignitaries from both within and without the empire, leaders of vassal nations, representatives from Rome, and other entities who came to the Karaltai to show their respects and conduct diplomacy. Guyuk took steps to reduce corruption, announcing that he would continue the policies of his father Agedei, not those of Terejin. He punished Terejin's supporters, except for Governor Argon the Elder. He also replaced young Kara Hulegu, the Khan of the Chagatai Khanate, with his favorite cousin Yesu Monki, to assert his newly conferred powers. He restored his father's officials to their former positions and was surrounded by Uyghur, Naiman and Central Asian officials, favoring Han Chinese commanders who had helped his father conquer northern China. He continued military operations in Korea, advanced into Song China in the south, and into Iraq in the west, and ordered an empire-wide census. Guyuk also divided the Sultanate of Rum between Is ad Din Kaikawas and Rukn ad Din Kilij Arslan. Though Kaikawas disagreed with this decision, not all parts of the empire respected Guyuk's election. The Hash Shashans, former Mongol allies whose grandmaster Hassan Jalaluddin had offered his submission to Genghis Khan in 1221, angered Guyuk by refusing to submit. Instead, he murdered the Mongol generals in Persia. Guyuk appointed his best friend's father El Jigadeh as chief commander of the troops in Persia and gave them the task of both reducing the strongholds of the assassins Muslim movement and conquering the Abbasids at the center of the Islamic world, Iran and Iraq. <laughs> Death of Guyuk 1248. In 1248, Guyuk raised more troops and suddenly marched westwards from the Mongol capital of Karakoram. The reasoning was unclear. Some sources wrote that he sought to recuperate at his personal estate, Emyl, others suggested that he might have been moving to join El Jigadeh to conduct a full-scale conquest of the Middle East, or possibly to make a surprise attack on his rival cousin Batu Khan in Russia. Suspicious of Guyuk's motives, Sorghortani Beki, the widow of Genghis's son Tolui, secretly warned her nephew Batu of Guyuk's approach. Batu had himself been traveling eastwards at the time, possibly to pay homage, or perhaps with other plans in mind. Before the forces of Batu and Guyuk met, Guyuk, sick and worn out by travel, died en route at Kum Sungir in Xinjiang, possibly a victim of poison. Guyuk's widow Ogil Kaimish stepped forward to take control of the empire, but she lacked the skills of her mother-in-law Terejin, and her young sons Koja and Naku and other princes challenged her authority. 
To decide on a new great Khan, Batu called a Karaltai on his own territory in 1250. As it was far from the Mongolian heartland, members of the Ogadiad and Chagatade families refused to attend. The Karaltai offered the throne to Batu, but he rejected it, claiming he had no interest in the position. Batu instead nominated Monki, a grandson of Genghis from his son Tolui's lineage. Monki was leading a Mongol army in Russia, the Northern Caucasus and Hungary. The pro-Tolui faction supported Batu's choice, and Monki was elected, though given the Karaltai's limited attendance and location, it was of questionable validity. Batu sent Monki, under the protection of his brothers, Burke and Tuktamur, and his son Sartak to assemble a more formal Karaltai at Kado Aral in the heartland. The supporters of Monki repeatedly invited Ogil Kaimish and the other major Ogadiad and Chagatade princes to attend the Karaltai, but they refused each time. The Ogadiad and Chagatade princes refused to accept a descendant of Genghis's son Tolui as leader, demanding that only descendants of Genghis's son Agedei could be Great Khan. Topic: <laughs> Rule of Monki Khan, 1251 to 1259. When Monk's mother Sork Hortani and their cousin Burke organized a second Karaltai on 1 July 1251, the assembled throng proclaimed Monkey Great Khan of the Mongol Empire. This marked a major shift in the leadership of the empire, transferring power from the descendants of Genghis's son Agedei to the descendants of Genghis's son Tolui. The decision was acknowledged by a few of the Ogadiad and Chagatade princes, such as Monk's cousin Kadan and the deposed Khan Kara Hulegu, but one of the other legitimate heirs, Ogadez's grandson Shiaman, sought to topple Monkey. Shiaman moved with his own forces towards the emperor's nomadic palace with a plan for an armed attack, but Monkey was alerted by his falconer of the plan. Monkey ordered an investigation of the plot, which led to a series of major trials all across the empire. Many members of the Mongol elite were found guilty and put to death, with estimates ranging from 77 to 300. Though princes of Genghis's royal line were often exiled rather than executed, Monkey confiscated the estates of the Ogadiad and the Chagatai families and shared the western part of the empire with his ally Batu Khan. After the bloody purge, Monkey ordered a general amnesty for prisoners and captives, but thereafter the power of the Great Khan's throne remained firmly with the descendants of Tolui. Topic: Administrative reforms. Monkey was a serious man who followed the laws of his ancestors and avoided alcoholism. He was tolerant of outside religions and artistic styles, leading to the building of foreign merchants' quarters, Buddhist monasteries, mosques, and Christian churches in the Mongol capital. As construction projects continued, Karakoram was adorned with Chinese, European, and Persian architecture. One famous example was a large silver tree with cleverly designed pipes that dispensed various drinks. The tree, topped by a triumphant angel, was crafted by Guillaume Boucher, a Parisian goldsmith. Although he had a strong Chinese contingent, Monkey relied heavily on Muslim and Mongol administrators and launched a series of economic reforms to make government expenses more predictable. His court limited government spending and prohibited nobles and troops from abusing civilians or issuing edicts without authorization. He commuted the contribution system to a fixed poll tax which was collected by imperial agents and forwarded to units in need. His court also tried to lighten the tax burden on commoners by reducing tax rates. He also centralized control of monetary affairs and reinforced the guards at the postal relays. Monkey ordered an empire-wide census in 1252 that took several years to complete and was not finished until Novgorod in the far northwest was counted in 1258. In another move to consolidate his power, Monkey assigned his brothers Halagu and Kublai to rule Persia and Mongol held China respectively. In the southern part of the empire, he continued his predecessor's struggle against the Song dynasty. In order to outflank the Song from three directions, Monkey dispatched Mongol armies under his brother Kublai to Yunnan, and under his uncle Iyeku to subdue Korea and pressure the Song from that direction as well. Kublai conquered the Dali Kingdom in 1253 after the Dali King Duan Xingzhi defected to the Mongols and helped them conquer the rest of Yunnan. Monk's general Kuoradai stabilized his control over Tibet, inducing leading monasteries to submit to Mongol rule. 
Subutai's son Yoyinkadai reduced the neighboring peoples of Yunnan to submission and defeated the Tran dynasty in northern Vietnam in 1257, but they had to draw back in 1258. The Mongol Empire tried to invade Vietnam again in 1284 and 1287 but were defeated both times. <laughs> New invasions of the Middle East and southern China After stabilizing the empire's finances, Monkey once again sought to expand its borders. At Kuraltais in Karakoram in 1253 and 1258 he approved new invasions of the Middle East and South China. Monkey put Halagu in overall charge of military and civil affairs in Persia, and appointed Chagatades and Jokids to join Hulagu's army. The Muslims from Kazvan denounced the menace of the Nazari Ismailis, a well-known sect of Shiites. The Mongol Naiman commander Kitbuka began to assault several Ismaili fortresses in 1253, before Halagu advanced in 1256. Ismaili Grandmaster Rukn al-Din Kashar surrendered in 1257 and was executed. All of the Ismaili strongholds in Persia were destroyed by Hulagu's army in 1257, except for Gurdka which held out until 1271. The center of the Islamic Empire at the time was Baghdad, which had held power for 500 years but was suffering internal divisions. When its caliph al-Mustazm refused to submit to the Mongols, Baghdad was besieged and captured by the Mongols in 1258 and subjected to a merciless sack, an event considered as one of the most catastrophic events in the history of Islam, and sometimes compared to the rupture of the Kaaba. With the destruction of the Abbasid Caliphate, Halagu had an open route to Syria and moved against the other Muslim powers in the region. His army advanced towards Ayyubid ruled Syria, capturing small local states en route. The Sultan al Nazir Yusuf of the Ayyubids refused to show himself before Halagu, however, he had accepted Mongol supremacy two decades earlier. When Halagu headed further west, the Armenians from Cilicia, the Seljuks from Rum and the Christian realms of Antioch and Tripoli submitted to Mongol authority, joining them in their assault against the Muslims. While some cities surrendered without resisting, others, such as Mayafarichan fought back, their populations were massacred and the cities were sacked. <laughs> Death of Monkey Khan 1259. Meanwhile, in the northwestern portion of the empire, Batu's successor and younger brother Burke sent punitive expeditions to Ukraine, Belarus, Lithuania and Poland. Dissension began brewing between the northwestern and southwestern sections of the Mongol Empire as Batu suspected that Hulagu's invasion of Western Asia would result in the elimination of Batu's own dominance there. In the southern part of the empire, Monkey Khan himself led his army to complete the conquest of China. Military operations were generally successful, but prolonged, so the forces did not withdraw to the north as was customary when the weather turned hot. Disease ravaged the Mongol forces with bloody epidemics, and Monkey died there on of August 1259. This event began a new chapter in the history of the Mongols, as again a decision needed to be made on a new Great Khan. Mongol armies across the empire withdrew from their campaigns to convene a new Kuraltai. Disunity Dispute over succession Monk's brother Halagu broke off his successful military advance into Syria, withdrawing the bulk of his forces to Mughan and leaving only a small contingent under his general Kitbuka. The opposing forces in the region, the Christian Crusaders and Muslim Mamluks, both recognizing that the Mongols were the greater threat, took advantage of the weakened state of the Mongol army and engaged in an unusual passive truce with each other. In 1260, the Mamluks advanced from Egypt, being allowed to camp and resupply near the Christian stronghold of Acre, and engaged Kitbuka's forces just north of Galilee at the Battle of Anjalit. The Mongols were defeated, and Kitbuka executed. This pivotal battle marked the western limit for Mongol expansion in the Middle East, and the Mongols were never again able to make serious military advances farther than Syria. In a separate part of the empire, Kublai Khan, another brother of Halagu and Monkey, heard of the Great Khan's death at the Huai River in China. Rather than returning to the capital, he continued his advance into the Wuchang area of China, near the Yangtze River. 
Their younger brother Aritboke took advantage of the absence of Halagu and Kublai, and used his position at the capital to win the title of Great Khan for himself, with representatives of all the family branches proclaiming him as the leader at the Karultai in Karakoram. When Kublai learned of this, he summoned his own Karultai at Kaiping, and nearly all the senior princes and great Noyans in North China and Manchuria supported his own candidacy over that of Aritboke. Topic: Mongolian Civil War. Battles ensued between the armies of Kublai and those of his brother Aritboke, which included forces still loyal to Monk's previous administration. Kublai's army easily eliminated Aritbuk's supporters and seized control of the civil administration in southern Mongolia. Further challenges took place from their cousins, the Chagatades. Kublai sent Abishka, a Chagatade prince loyal to him, to take charge of Chagatai's realm. But Aritboke captured and then executed Abishka, having his own man Algu crowned there instead. Kublai's new administration blockaded Aritboke in Mongolia to cut off food supplies, causing a famine. Karakoram fell quickly to Kublai, but Aritboke rallied and retook the capital in 1261. In southwestern Ilkhanate, Halagu was loyal to his brother Kublai, but clashes with their cousin Burke, the ruler of the Golden Horde, began in 1262. The suspicious deaths of Jokhad princes in Hulagu's service, unequal distribution of war booty, and Hulagu's massacres of Muslims increased the anger of Burke, who considered supporting a rebellion of the Georgian kingdom against Hulagu's rule in 1259–1260. Burke also forged an alliance with the Egyptian Mamluks against Halagu and supported Kublai's rival claimant, Arik Boke. Halagu died on 8 February 1264. Burke sought to take advantage and invade Hulagu's realm, but he died along the way, and a few months later Algu Khan of the Chagatai Khanate died as well. Kublai named Hulagu's son Abaka as new Ilkhan, and nominated Batu's grandson Monkey Taimur to lead the Golden Horde. Abaka sought foreign alliances, such as attempting to form a Franco-Mongol alliance against the Egyptian Mamluks. Arikbuka surrendered to Kublai at Shangdu on 21 August 1264. Topic: Campaigns of Kublai Khan 1264 to 1294. In the south, after the fall of Xiangyang in 1273, the Mongols sought the final conquest of the Song dynasty in South China. In 1271, Kublai renamed the new Mongol regime in China as the Yuan dynasty and sought to sinicize his image as emperor of China to win the control of the Chinese people. Kublai moved his headquarters to Dadu, the genesis for what later became the modern city of Beijing. His establishment of a capital there was a controversial move to many Mongols who accused him of being too closely tied to Chinese culture. The Mongols were eventually successful in their campaigns against Song China, and the Chinese Song imperial family surrendered to the Yuan in 1276, making the Mongols the first non Chinese people to conquer all of China. Kublai used his base to build a powerful empire, creating an academy, offices, trade ports and canals, and sponsoring arts and science. Mongol records list 20,166 public schools created during his reign. After achieving actual or nominal dominion over much of Eurasia and successfully conquering China, Kublai pursued further expansion. His invasions of Burma and Sakhalin were costly, and his attempted invasions of Annam and Champa ended in devastating defeat, but secured vassal statuses of those countries. The Mongol armies were repeatedly beaten in Annam and were crushed at the Battle of Bark Dang 1288. Nogai and Konchi, the Khan of the White Horde, established friendly relations with the Yuan dynasty and the Ilkhanate. Political disagreement among contending branches of the family over the office of Great Khan continued, but the economic and commercial success of the Mongol Empire continued despite the squabbling. <laughs> <laughs> Disintegration into competing entities Major changes occurred in the Mongol Empire in the late 1200s. Kublai Khan, after having conquered all of China and established the Yuan dynasty, died in 1294. He was succeeded by his grandson Taimur Khan, who continued Kublai's policies. 
At the same time the Toluid Civil War, along with the Burk Halagu War and the subsequent Kaidu Kublai War, greatly weakened the authority of the Great Khan over the entirety of the Mongol Empire and the empire fractured into autonomous Khanates, the Yuan Dynasty and the three Western Khanates, the Golden Horde, the Chagatai Khanate and the Ilkhanate. Only the Ilkhanate remained loyal to the Yuan court but endured its own power struggle, in part because of a dispute with the growing Islamic factions within the southwestern part of the empire. After the death of Kaidu, the Chattagai ruler Dua initiated a peace proposal and persuaded the Agedayids to submit to Taimur Khan. In 1304, all of the Khanates approved a peace treaty and accepted Yuan Emperor Tamur's supremacy. This established the nominal supremacy of the Yuan dynasty over the Western Khanates, which was to last for several decades. This supremacy was based on weaker foundations than that of the earlier Khagans and each of the four Khanates continued to develop separately and function as independent states. Nearly a century of conquest and civil war was followed by relative stability, the Pax Mongolica, and international trade and cultural exchanges flourished between Asia and Europe. Communication between the Yuan dynasty in China and the Ilkhanate in Persia further encouraged trade and commerce between East and West. Patterns of Yuan royal textiles could be found on the opposite side of the empire adorning Armenian decorations, trees and vegetables were transplanted across the empire, and technological innovations spread from Mongol dominions towards the West. Pope John XXII was presented a memorandum from the Eastern Church describing the Pax Mongolica. Kagan is one of the greatest monarchs and all lords of the state, e.g., the king of al Malai, Chagatai Khanate, Emperor Abu Sayyid, and Uzbek Khan, are his subjects, saluting his holiness to pay their respects. However, while the four Khanates continued to interact with one another well into the 14th century, they did so as sovereign states and never again pooled their resources in a cooperative military endeavor. Topic. Development of the Khanates In spite of his conflicts with Kaidu and Dua, Yuan Emperor Taimur established a tributary relationship with the warlike Shan people after his series of military operations against Thailand from 1297 to 1303. This was to mark the end of the southern expansion of the Mongols. When Ghazan took the throne of the Ilkhanate in 1295, he formally accepted Islam as his own religion, marking a turning point in Mongol history after which Mongol Persia became more and more Islamic. Despite this, Ghazan continued to strengthen ties with Taimur Khan and the Yuan dynasty in the east. It was politically useful to advertise the Great Khan's authority in the Ilkhanate, because the Golden Horde in Russia had long made claims on nearby Georgia. Within four years, Ghazan began sending tribute to the Yuan court and appealing to other Khans to accept Taimur Khan as their overlord. He oversaw an extensive program of cultural and scientific interaction between the Ilkhanate and the Yuan dynasty in the following decades. Ghazan's faith may have been Islamic, but he continued his ancestors' war with the Egyptian Mamluks, and consulted with his old Mongolian advisers in his native tongue. He defeated the Mamluk army at the Battle of Wadi al Khazandar in 1299, but he was only briefly able to occupy Syria, due to distracting raids from the Chagatai Khanate under its de facto ruler Kaidu, who was at war with both the Ilkhans and the Yuan dynasty. Struggling for influence within the Golden Horde, Kaidu sponsored his own candidate Kobaleg against Bayan. R. 1299-1304, the Khan of the White Horde. Bayan, after receiving military support from the Mongols in Russia, requested assistance from both Taimur Khan and the Ilkhanate to organize a unified attack against Kaidu's forces. Taimur was amenable and attacked Kaidu a year later. After a bloody battle with Tamur's armies near the Zorkan River in 1301, Kaidu died and was succeeded by Dua. Dua was challenged by Kaidu's son Chapa, but with the assistance of Taimur, Dua defeated the Agedayids. Tokta of the Golden Horde, also seeking a general peace, sent 20,000 men to buttress the Yuan frontier. Tokta died in 1312, though, and was succeeded by Ozbeg R. 1313-41, who seized the throne of the Golden Horde and persecuted non-Muslim Mongols. The Yuan's influence on the Horde was largely reversed and border clashes between Mongol states resumed. Ayabawada Bayantu Khan's envoys backed Tokta's son against Ozbeg, in the Chagatai Khanate, Azen Bukharai r. 
(1309–1318) was enthroned as Khan after suppressing a sudden rebellion by Ogadez descendants and driving Chapa into exile. The Yuan and Ilkhanid armies eventually attacked the Chagatai Khanate. Recognizing the potential economic benefits and the Genghisid legacy, Osbeg reopened friendly relations with the Yuan in 1326. He strengthened ties with the Muslim world as well, building mosques and other elaborate structures such as baths. By the second decade of the 14th century, Mongol invasions had further decreased. In 1323, Abu Sa'id Khan of the Ilkhanate signed a peace treaty with Egypt. At his request, the Yuan court awarded his custodian Chupan the title of commander in chief of all Mongol Khanates, but Chupan died in late 1327. Civil war erupted in the Yuan dynasty in 1328 to 29. After the death of Yesen Taimur in 1328, Tug Taimur became the new leader in Dadu, while Yesen Taimur's son Ragabar succeeded to the throne in Shangdu, leading to the civil war known as the War of the Two Capitals. Tuk Taimur defeated Ragabar, but the Chagatai Khan El Jigadi supported Kasala, elder brother of Tuk Taimur, as Great Khan. He invaded with a commanding force, and Tuk Taimur abdicated. Kasala was elected Khan on 30 August 1329. Kasala was then poisoned by a Kaipchak commander under Tuk Taimur, who returned to power. Tuk Taimur was knowledgeable about Chinese language and history and was also a creditable poet, calligrapher, and painter. In order to be accepted by other Khanates as the sovereign of the Mongol world, he sent Genghisid princes and descendants of notable Mongol generals to the Chagatai Khanate, Ilkhan Abu Sa'id, and Ozbeg. In response to the emissaries, they all agreed to send tribute each year. Furthermore, Tuk Taimur gave lavish presents and an imperial seal to El Jigadi to mollify his anger. Topic: <inaudible> Relict states of the Mongol Empire. With the death of Ilkhan Abu Sa'id Bahatur in 1335, Mongol rule faltered and Persia fell into political anarchy. A year later his successor was killed by an Oirat governor, and the Ilkhanate was divided between the Suldus, the Jaliyir, Kasserid Toha Taimur d. 1353, and Persian warlords. Taking advantage of the chaos, the Georgians pushed the Mongols out of their territory, and the Oiga commander Aretna established an independent state in Anatolia in 1336. Following the downfall of their Mongol masters, the loyal vassal, the Armenian Kingdom of Cilicia, received escalating threats from the Mamluks and were eventually overrun. Along with the dissolution of the Ilkhanate in Persia, Mongol rulers in China and the Chagatai Khanate were also in turmoil. The plague known as the Black Death, which started in the Mongol dominions and spread to Europe, added to the confusion. Disease devastated all the Khanates, cutting off commercial ties and killing millions. Plague may have taken 50 million lives in Europe alone in the 14th century. As the power of the Mongols declined, chaos erupted throughout the empire as non Mongol leaders expanded their own influence. The Golden Horde lost all of its western dominions including modern Belarus and Ukraine to Poland and Lithuania between 1342 and 1369. Muslim and non-Muslim princes in the Chagatai Khanate warred with each other from 1331 to 1343, and the Chagatai Khanate disintegrated when non-Genghisid warlords set up their own puppet khans in Transoxiana and Mogulistan. Janibeg Khan R. 1342-1357, briefly reasserted Jokhid dominance over the Chahatades. Demanding submission from an offshoot of the Ilkhanate in Azerbaijan, he boasted that Today three Ulysses are under my control. However, rival families of the Jokids began fighting for the throne of the Golden Horde after the assassination of his successor Berdebek Khan in 1359. The last Yuan ruler Tohen Taimur R. 1333-70 was powerless to regulate those troubles, a sign that the empire had nearly reached its end. His court's unbacked currency had entered a hyperinflationary spiral and the Han Chinese people revolted due to the Yuan's harsh impositions. 
In the 1350s, Gongmin of Goryeo successfully pushed Mongolian garrisons back and exterminated the family of Tohen Taimur Khan's empress while Tai Sichu Changhub Gyaltsen managed to eliminate the Mongol influence in Tibet. Increasingly isolated from their subjects, the Mongols quickly lost most of China to the rebellious Ming forces and in 1368 fled to their heartland in Mongolia. After the overthrow of the Yuan dynasty the Golden Horde lost touch with Mongolia and China, while the two main parts of the Chagatai Khanate were defeated by Timur 1405, who founded the Timurid Empire. However, remnants of the Chagatai Khanate survived, the last Chagatade state to survive was the Yarkant Khanate, until its defeat by the Oirat Zingar Khanate in the Zingar conquest of Altashar in 1680. The Golden Horde broke into smaller Turkic hordes that declined steadily in power over four centuries. Among them, the Khanate Shadow, the Great Horde, survived until 1502, when one of its successors, the Crimean Khanate, sacked Sarai. The Crimean Khanate lasted until 1783, whereas Khanates such as the Khanate of Bukhara and the Kazakh Khanate lasted even longer. Military organization The number of troops mustered by the Mongols is the subject of some scholarly debate, but was at least 105,000 in 1206. The Mongol military organization was simple but effective, based on the decimal system. The army was built up from squads of ten men each, Arbans 10 people, Zuans 100, Mingans 1,000, and Tumans 10, .The Mongols were most famous for their horse archers, but troops armed with lances were equally skilled, and the Mongols recruited other military talents from the lands they conquered. With experienced Chinese engineers and a bombardier corps which was expert at building trebuchets, catapults and other machines, the Mongols could lay siege to fortified positions, sometimes building machinery on the spot using available local resources. Forces under the command of the Mongol Empire were trained, organized, and equipped for mobility and speed. Mongol soldiers were more lightly armored than many of the armies they faced but were able to make up for it with maneuverability. Each Mongol warrior would usually travel with multiple horses, allowing him to quickly switch to a fresh mount as needed. In addition, soldiers of the Mongol army functioned independently of supply lines, considerably speeding up army movement. Skillful use of couriers enabled the leaders of these armies to maintain contact with each other. Discipline was inculcated during a nerge traditional hunt, as reported by Yuvani. These hunts were distinctive from hunts in other cultures, being the equivalent to small unit actions. Mongol forces would spread out in a line, surround an entire region, and then drive all of the game within that area together. The goal was to let none of the animals escape and to slaughter them all. Another advantage of the Mongols was their ability to traverse large distances, even in unusually cold winters, for instance, frozen rivers led them like highways to large urban centers on their banks. The Mongols were adept at river work, crossing the river Sajo in spring flood conditions with 30,000 cavalry soldiers in a single night during the Battle of Mohi April 1241 to defeat the Hungarian king Bela IV. Similarly, in the attack against the Muslim Khwarezmshah a flotilla of barges was used to prevent escape on the river, traditionally known for their prowess with ground forces, the Mongols rarely used naval power. In the 1260s and 1270s they used sea power while conquering the Song dynasty of China, though their attempts to mount seaborne campaigns against Japan were unsuccessful. Around the eastern Mediterranean, their campaigns were almost exclusively land-based, with the seas controlled by the Crusader and Mamluk forces. All military campaigns were preceded by careful planning, reconnaissance, and the gathering of sensitive information relating to enemy territories and forces. The success, organization, and mobility of the Mongol armies permitted them to fight on several fronts at once. All adult males up to the age of 60 were eligible for conscription into the army, a source of honor in their tribal warrior tradition. <laughs> <laughs> Society Law and governance The Mongol Empire was governed by a code of law devised by Genghis, called Yasa, meaning order or decree. 
A particular canon of this code was that those of rank shared much the same hardship as the common man. It also imposed severe penalties, e.g., the death penalty if one mounted soldier following another did not pick up something dropped from the mount in front. Penalties were also decreed for rape and to some extent for murder. Any resistance to Mongol rule was met with massive collective punishment. Cities were destroyed and their inhabitants slaughtered if they defied Mongol orders. Under Yasser, chiefs and generals were selected based on merit. The empire was governed by a non-democratic, parliamentary-style central assembly, called Karultai, in which the Mongol chiefs met with the Great Khan to discuss domestic and foreign policies. Karultais were also convened for the selection of each new Great Khan. Genghis Khan also created a national seal, encouraged the use of a written alphabet in Mongolia, and exempted teachers, lawyers, and artists from taxes. The Mongols imported Central Asian Muslims to serve as administrators in China and sent Han Chinese and Khatans from China to serve as administrators over the Muslim population in Bukhara in Central Asia, thus using foreigners to curtail the power of the local peoples of both lands. The Mongols were tolerant of other religions, and rarely persecuted people on religious grounds. This was associated with their culture and progressive thought. Some historians of the 20th century thought this was a good military strategy. When Genghis was at war with Sultan Muhammad of Khwarezm, other Islamic leaders did not join the fight, as it was seen as a non holy war between two individuals. Religions <inaudible> 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 At the time of Genghis Khan, virtually every religion had found Mongol converts, from Buddhism to Christianity, from Manichaeism to Islam. To avoid strife, Genghis Khan set up an institution that ensured complete religious freedom, though he himself was a shamanist. Under his administration, all religious leaders were exempt from taxation and from public service. Initially, there were few formal places of worship because of the nomadic lifestyle. However, under Agedei (1186–1241), several building projects were undertaken in the Mongol capital. Along with palaces, Agedei built houses of worship for the Buddhist, Muslim, Christian, and Taoist followers. The dominant religions at that time were shamanism, Tengrism, and Buddhism. Although Ogadez's wife was a Nestorian Christian, eventually, each of the successor states adopted the dominant religion of the local populations. The Chinese Mongolian Yuan dynasty in the east, originally the Great Khan's domain, embraced Buddhism and shamanism, while the three Western Khanates adopted Islam. Topic: <laughs> Arts and Literature. The oldest surviving literary work in the Mongolian language is The Secret History of the Mongols, which was written for the royal family some time after Genghis Khan's death in 1227. It is the most significant native account of Genghis's life and genealogy, covering his origins and childhood through to the establishment of the Mongol Empire and the reign of his son, Agedei. Another classic from the empire is the Jaime al Tawarik, or Universal History. It was commissioned in the early 14th century by the Ilkhan Abaka Khan as a way of documenting the entire world's history, to help establish the Mongols' own cultural legacy. Mongol scribes in the 14th century used a mixture of resin and vegetable pigments as a primitive form of correction fluid, this is arguably its first known usage. The Mongols also appreciated the visual arts, though their taste in portraiture was strictly focused on portraits of their horses, rather than of people. Mail system The Mongol Empire had an ingenious and efficient mail system for the time, often referred to by scholars as the Yam. It had lavishly furnished and well-guarded relay posts known as Ortu set up throughout the empire. A messenger would typically travel 25 miles, 40 kilometers, from one station to the next, either receiving a fresh, rested horse, or relaying the mail to the next rider to ensure the speediest possible delivery. The Mongol riders regularly covered 125 miles, 200 kilometers per day, better than the fastest record set by the Pony Express some 600 years later. The relay stations had attached households to service them. Anyone with a pazer was allowed to stop there for remounts and specified rations, while those carrying military identities used the yam even without a pazer. 
Many merchants, messengers, and travelers from China, the Middle East, and Europe used the system. When the Great Khan died in Karakoram, news reached the Mongol forces under Batu Khan in Central Europe within four to six weeks thanks to the Yamp Genghis and his successor Igedei built a wide system of roads, one of which carved through the Altai Mountains. After his enthronement, Igedei further expanded the road system, ordering the Chagatai Khanate and Golden Horde to link up roads in western parts of the Mongol Empire. Kublai Khan, founder of the Yuan dynasty, built special relays for high officials, as well as ordinary relays, that had hostels. During Kublai's reign, the Yuan communication system consisted of some 1,400 postal stations, which used 50,000 horses, 8,400 oxen, 6,700 mules, 4,000 carts, and 6,000 boats. In Manchuria and southern Siberia, the Mongols still used dogsled relays for the Yam. In the Ilkhanate, Ghazan restored the declining relay system in the Middle East on a restricted scale. He constructed some hostels and decreed that only imperial envoys could receive a stipend. The Jockets of the Golden Horde financed their relay system by a special yam tax. Topic. Silk Road The Mongols had a history of supporting merchants and trade. Genghis Khan had encouraged foreign merchants early in his career, even before uniting the Mongols. Merchants provided information about neighboring cultures, served as diplomats and official traders for the Mongols, and were essential for many goods, since the Mongols produced little of their own. Mongols sometimes provided capital for merchants and sent them far afield, in an autoke merchant partner arrangement. As the empire grew, any merchants or ambassadors with proper documentation and authorization received protection and sanctuary as they traveled through Mongol realms. Well-traveled and relatively well-maintained roads linked lands from the Mediterranean basin to China, greatly increasing overland trade and resulting in some dramatic stories of those who traveled through what would become known as the Silk Road. Western explorer Marco Polo traveled east along the Silk Road, and the Chinese Mongol monk Rabban Bar Salma made a comparably epic journey along the route, venturing from his home of Kanbalik, Beijing, as far as Europe. European missionaries, such as William of Rubruck, also traveled to the Mongol court to convert believers to the cause, or went as papal envoys to correspond with Mongol rulers in an attempt to secure a Franco-Mongol alliance. It was rare, however, for anyone to journey the full length of Silk Road. Instead, merchants moved products like a bucket brigade, goods being traded from one middleman to another, moving from China all the way to the west. The goods moved over such long distances fetched extravagant prices. After Genghis, the merchant partner business continued to flourish under his successors Agede and Guyuk. Merchants brought clothing, food, information, and other provisions to the imperial palaces, and in return the great khans gave the merchants tax exemptions and allowed them to use the official relay stations of the Mongol Empire. Merchants also served as tax farmers in China, Russia and Iran. If the merchants were attacked by bandits, losses were made up from the imperial treasury, policies changed under the great khan monkey. Because of money laundering and overtaxing, he attempted to limit abuses and sent imperial investigators to supervise the autoke businesses. He decreed that all merchants must pay commercial and property taxes, and he paid off all drafts drawn by high-ranking Mongol elites from the merchants. This policy continued under the Yuan dynasty. The fall of the Mongol Empire in the 14th century led to the collapse of the political, cultural, and economic unity along the Silk Road. Turkic tribes seized the western end of the route from the Byzantine Empire, sowing the seeds of a Turkic culture that would later crystallize into the Ottoman Empire under the Sunni faith. In the east, the native Chinese overthrew the Yuan dynasty in 1368, launching their own Ming dynasty and pursuing a policy of economic isolationism. Topic. Legacy. The Mongol Empire, at its height the largest contiguous empire in history, had a lasting impact, unifying large regions. Some of these, such as eastern and western Russia and the western parts of China, remain unified today. 
Mongols might have been assimilated into local populations after the fall of the empire, and some of their descendants adopted local religions, for example, the Eastern Khanate largely adopted Buddhism, and the three Western Khanates adopted Islam, largely under Sufi influence. According to some interpretations, Genghis Khan's conquests caused wholesale destruction on an unprecedented scale in certain geographic regions, leading to changes in the demographics of Asia. The non-military achievements of the Mongol Empire include the introduction of a writing system, a Mongol alphabet based on the characters of the Uyghur language, which is still used in Mongolia today. Some of the other long-term consequences of the Mongol Empire include Moscow rose to prominence while it was still under the rule of the Mongol Tatar yoke, some time after Russian rulers were accorded the status of tax collectors for the Mongols. The fact that the Russians collected tribute and taxes for the Mongols meant that the Mongols themselves rarely visited the lands which they owned. The Russians eventually gained military power, and their ruler Ivan III completely overthrew the Mongols and formed the Russian Tsardom. After the Great Stand on the Ugra River proved that the Mongols were vulnerable, the Grand Duchy of Moscow gained independence. Europe's knowledge of the known world was immensely expanded by the information which was brought back to it by ambassadors and merchants. When Columbus sailed in 1492, his mission was to reach Cathay, the land of the Grand Khan in China, and give him a letter from the monarchs Ferdinand II of Aragon and Isabella I of Castile. Some studies indicate that the Black Death which devastated Europe in the late 1340s may have traveled from China to Europe along the trade routes of the Mongol Empire. In 1347, the Genoese possessor of Kaffa, a great trade emporium on the Crimean Peninsula, came under siege by an army of Mongol warriors under the command of Janibeg. After a protracted siege during which the Mongol army was reportedly withering from disease, they decided to use the infected corpses as a biological weapon. The corpses were catapulted over the city walls, infecting the inhabitants. The Genoese traders fled, transferring the plague via their ships into the south of Europe, from where it rapidly spread. The total number of deaths worldwide from the pandemic is estimated at 75 to 200 million with up to 50 million deaths in Europe alone. Western researcher R. J. Rummel estimated that 30 million people were killed under the rule of the Mongol Empire. Other researchers estimate that as many as 80 million people were killed, with 50 million deaths being the middle ground. The population of China fell by half during 50 years of Mongol rule. Before the Mongol invasion, the territories of the Chinese dynasties reportedly had approximately 120 million inhabitants. After the conquest was completed in 1279, the 1300 census reported that China's total population was roughly 60 million. While it is tempting to attribute this major decline in China's population solely to Mongol ferocity, today scholars have mixed opinions about this subject. Scholars such as Frederick W. Moat argue that the wide drop in numbers reflects an administrative failure to keep records rather than a de facto decrease, whilst others such as Timothy Brook argue that the Mongols reduced much of the South Chinese population, and very debatably the Han Chinese population, to an invisible status through cancellation of the right to passports and denial of the right to direct land ownership. This meant that the Chinese had to depend on and be cared for chiefly by Mongols and Tatars, which also involved recruitment into the Mongol army. Other historians such as William McNeil and David O. Morgan argue that the bubonic plague was the main factor behind China's demographic decline during this period. The Islamic world was subjected to massive changes as a result of the Mongol invasions. The population of the Iranian plateau suffered from widespread disease and famine, resulting in the death of up to three quarters of its population, possibly 10 to 15 million people. Historian Stephen Ward estimates that Iran's population did not reach its pre-Mongol levels again until the mid-20th century. David Nicole states in The Mongol Warlords, "...terror and mass extermination of anyone opposing them was a well-tested Mongol tactic." About half of the Russian population may have died during the invasion. However, Colin McKeevdy in Atlas of World Population History, 1978 estimates the population of Russia in Europe dropped from 7.5 million prior to the invasion to 7 million afterwards. Historians estimate that up to half of Hungary's 2 million population were victims of the Mongol invasion. Historian Andrea Pito says that Regerius, an eyewitness, said that 
the Mongols killed everybody regardless of gender or age, and the Mongols especially found pleasure in humiliating women. One of the more successful tactics employed by the Mongols was to wipe out urban populations that refused to surrender. During the Mongol invasion of Rus, almost all major cities were destroyed. If they chose to submit, the people were generally spared, though this was not guaranteed. For example, the city of Hamadan in modern-day Iran was destroyed and every man, woman, and child executed by Mongol general Subadai, after surrendering to him but failing to have enough provisions for his Mongol scouting force. Several days after the initial raising of the city, Subadai sent a force back to the burning ruins and the site of the massacre to kill any inhabitants of the city who had been away at the time of the initial slaughter and had returned in the meantime. Mongolian armies made use of local peoples and their soldiers, often incorporating them into their armies. Prisoners of war sometimes were given the choice between death and becoming part of the Mongol army to aid in future conquests. In addition to intimidation tactics, the rapid expansion of the empire was facilitated by military hardiness especially during bitterly cold winters, military skill, meritocracy, and discipline. The Crimean Khanate and other descendants, such as the Mughal royal family of South Asia, are descended from Genghis Khan. Baba's mother was a descendant, whereas his father was directly descended from Timur Tamerlane. The word, Mughal, is a Persian word for Mongol. The Kalmyks were the last Mongol nomads to penetrate European territory, having migrated to Europe from Central Asia at the turn of the 17th century. In the winter of 1770–1771, approximately 200,000 Kalmyks began the journey from their pastures on the left bank of the Volga River to Zingaria, through the territories of their Kazakh and Kyrgyz enemies. After several months of travel, only one-third of the original group reached Zingaria in northwest China. Some Turco Mongol Khanates lasted into recent centuries, the Crimean Khanate lasted until 1783, the Khanate of Bukhara lasted until 1920, the Kazakh Khanate lasted until 1847, the Khanate of Kokand lasted until 1876, and the Khanate of Kiva survived as a Russian protectorate until 1917. See also Mughal-Mongol genealogy Destruction under the Mongol Empire Yelu Chukai